Good. We good now? Testing, testing. I can hear a little bit, just a little bit. That's a little better. That's better now. That's good. All right, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending One Step Ahead, Defeating Tomorrow's Security Solutions, part one. Go ahead. Slide. Hi, I'm Jared, and this is Joe. Hi, Joe. Aw. We're excited to be here. I'm excited to be here today for two reasons. The first reason is I'm not in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where we originally grew up. Joe had a direct flight out here. I had a little bit of a layover slide. So with that, I just got to say, go Army, beat Navy. We were up three points before this uh, presentation started. But uh, eventually, I found my way out here to the Bay Area, and that gets me excited. Slide. And the second reason is we're here today, so thank you, Bay Threat. This is actually our first security conference talk. Uh, so it's quite exciting for us. And hopefully it won't be our last one. So slide. High five. All right, now for the real slides. Go ahead. Today's discussion, we're going to talk about the threat landscape, specifically malware for Windows. That, that's what we like to focus on. We're going to talk about a summary of, of you know, ways people have tried to stop it in the past, very briefly. And then we're going to get into the meat of the discussion, which is talking about application whitelisting, which we think is one of the new breeds of uh, endpoint security. And we're going to show you how we like to break it in some ways. And then we're going to give you some suggestions. So if you deploy application whitelisting wherever you are, uh, it doesn't get broken on you. Next slide. Uh, malware is bad. I, I don't know if I need to go into any more detail than that here, but slide. It's also prevalent. And whether you, uh, you know, read the newspaper, read reports off of agencies in the security industry, or just have your own empirical data, uh, malware is a problem. It's grown as a problem. It's continuing to grow, and there aren't really that great of a solution set for it quite yet, especially when people are motivated. So slide. So essentially what you have is this problem set that's very good at not being detected and bypassing a lot of the ways we've tried in the last 10, 15 years to stop it. Uh, you know, AV, black, blacklisting is not enough. I think everyone recognizes that. Slide. So what we, we think is there's been a creation of like a new breed of endpoint security technology and one of them, today's part one, and it's application whitelisting. And part two will be to be determined at some time in 2013. So come to that talk as well. And we'll do a you know, dynamic behavioral analysis speech. But slide. Malware is a rampant issue. We view it still as a large problem. The problem with using those two new breeds of technology in our mind is that they've been around for a couple years, but they haven't been been adopted very rampantly across the actual customers and across the industry wide. So what that means is during these years of the technology's existence, malware developers have also had time to play with it, which means we're seeing today malware that already defeats the technology of tomorrow or technology of today, whatever you want to call it. And so we, we broke down how it's typically broken into four categories. Uh, starting with least desirable to like most desirable from uh, a red hat perspective and you know cause unwanted behavior in uh, you know on the machine through using that device and breaking that security product bypassing the entire method of detection entirely and then directly altering the security product I mean AV went through these processes as well now we're seeing whitelisting and behavioral analysis go through it so the meat of the discussion, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. We're actually going to show you two of these techniques on how to break application whitelisting and then give you some tips. So Joe. Hello. Sorry. All right. So I'm going to talk about first application whitelisting and really quick what it is. So it's essentially the opposite of signature-based antivirus. So signature-based antivirus assumes everything it doesn't know about is good. And application whitelisting says everything I don't know about is bad. 
And what that allows it to do is detect the things that would otherwise go undetected. So a new threat that's developed today, malware that's pushed out, will suddenly be detected by this application whitelisting solution. And when it is, it has a choice. It can either prevent it from executing, it can prompt the end user to tell them that something is trying to launch that isn't recognized, or it can just audit that behavior and report it to some security console where your security department can figure it out. Now, this is a tremendous advantage over signature-based AV, which can only detect what it knows. Unfortunately, though, there's still ways to defeat it. Uh, even when you run application whitelisting solutions in their most secure mode of operation, I see, still see about four different ways you can really approach breaking that solution or bypassing it. So if your malware is already present before they even go to install their application whitelisting product, it can do a few things. One, it can prevent the installation from even being successful, breaking the installation and not allowing that product to get installed. And if it wants to be particularly subtle about it, it can make it look like a product malfunction so you end up swearing at your product instead of thinking there's a piece of malware present. It can exploit an existing application that's already in the whitelist. So Internet Explorer, Microsoft Office, Adobe Acrobat, Java, whatever there are exploits and vulnerabilities that can allow malicious code to run. And if that application is already whitelisted, it's going to be able to do that. And then the meat of this talk is going to be looking at the two other ways of exploiting it, which is to exploit the certificate mechanisms by which a lot of application whitelisting products allow software to run, and to install a kernel level driver that can go undetected. Uh, now, for the purposes of the demo I'm going to do, I'm going to make a few assumptions, and I can't really go into depth on why I'm making them because there's not enough time. But the threats that are most concerning are the ones for which this is, these assumptions are true. And they are malicious action is going to take place on one of your endpoints. So either they're going to exploit some whitelisted application, or they're going to directly hack in with some credentials. And once they're able to do that malicious action, they're going to do it from an administrator account with permissions to make system modifications. And they're going to be able to bypass the protection offered by something like a user account control. So with that in mind, let's go to the demo and hope it works. All right. So right here, I have loaded a virtual machine. And running inside the virtual machine is an application whitelisting product. Uh, I don't want to pick on the vendor, so I don't I've removed any sort of reference to it here, but the techniques are sort of applicable across a wide range of the application whitelisting products. So basically, there's a few applications here that I have that are legitimate. You have Process Monitor, which is a tool by SysInternals, and we're allowed to launch it. Now, if you were a behavioral product, you might think this thing was suspicious if you hadn't seen it, because it's monitoring all sorts of low-level behavior on the uh, computer. And then you have Crossloop, which is a remote uh, desktop type device that allows access to the computer. Again, if you're behavioral, there might be issues with it. Now, an application whitelisting product is allowing it to proceed because I've added this digital signing certificates for each of these products to the list of applications that are recognized by the product. So these allow it to function. And the reason these exist is because it's really hard to manage an application whitelisting solution if you have to tell it exactly what executables exist in your environment. This is sort of a shorthand way to say, oh, trust anything from Microsoft or trust anything from Adobe. Now, on the other end of things, you have the stuff that's not allowed to run, something like this fake malware that I created. And if you try to launch it, what you'll see is that it tells you you don't have permissions to do that. If you try to launch it another way or another application, you'll see, again, it's blocking it. And the reason is because it is a not a recognized application, so it prevents the execution. You'll note that the fake malware uh, actually has a signed certificate, but the fake malware cert signer isn't something that the uh, product is designed to recognize, so it doesn't allow it. And the malicious reparse uh, piece of malware doesn't even have a digital certificate. So what I want to show off here is how I can take advantage of this certificate mechanism in order to exploit the protection that's offered. And the way I'm going to do that is by exploiting this by just adding one registry key into the registry. So that'll be put in place. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to redirect where it looks for its legitimate certificates to this fake cert store I've created on the desktop. 
and I'm going to take this malicious application certificate that I showed you earlier. I'm going to add it into here, and after a restart, once this kicks in, we're going to be able to run this application. In the meantime, it still can't run, but as you'll see, restart the computer and we'll see different behavior out of this. Now, the crux of this is because application whitelisting products have to keep some sort of local version of their whitelisted applications. If they don't, that means they have to reach out to some network resource, which becomes, one, time consuming and hard to deliver performance on, and two, an issue because essentially you've created a new vulnerability for malicious developers to target. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to change the way it reads its certificate so that we can take control over what it recognizes as legitimate. And even though application whitelisting solutions tend to try to protect this in some ways, what we find is that they're not sophisticated products in terms of you know, registry protection mechanisms or things like that. So that simple registry key that I've put in place is going to allow me to redirect the way it's actually looking for its certificates. So now we're going to log back in. And the first thing we're going to look at is a denial of service attack. So basically, think about how all these certificates are allowing your legitimate applications to run. Well, if suddenly those certificates aren't there anymore, those legitimate products you are counting on aren't going to launch properly. Now all of a sudden this is blocked whereas it was running before. If we try to launch Crossloop, same thing. And the reason for that is because we've removed its certificates. So now we can make it look like the application whitelisting product is malfunctioning. So you're going to go about it, you're going to go type on a forum and swear at whoever created the product that their product isn't doing its job correctly, but it's because it's been exploited. Now if we take the legitimate certificates that we had before, and then we add it back into this fake search store I've created, all of a sudden, we can launch these applications again. Cross loop. Allowed to launch it again. Take out its certificate. Can't launch it again. So we've basically completely hijacked the mechanism by which it allows applications to run on this computer. And what that allows me to do is not only perform these denial of attacks, or denial of service attacks, but also to say my fake malware that I just created here is allowed to run. So this attack, when combined with some sort of auto-running mechanism, allows malware to persist on that endpoint, run as it normally would, and you're going to think your application whitelisting solution is working properly just as long as I don't name it fake search store and put it directly on the user's desktop. So this is one method we found for bypassing the protection offered by application whitelisting solutions. There's another method that I find a little bit more interesting personally. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the architecture of how these products are designed. And basically, they create system drivers that are run. And the reason they do this is because the drivers can run at a really low level and intercept what sort of commands are coming from the file system or from the registry. Now, this is a really good way to do things. But unfortunately, it provides another opportunity for a malicious attack. And by that, I mean, if I can put my own driver in place and start before the application whitelisting process driver has had a chance to launch, it can no longer prevent me from launching my solution. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take advantage of a little trick. Now, many of you might know that Windows 7 won't let you just run any driver you want. It has to have a legitimate signature. So you could try to spoof that mechanism, or you could try to disable this protection. But what I find to be a little more smooth is simply to take an existing driver that is signed, in this case callback filter, and add it to the drivers folder and exploit the ability to use this legitimate driver for malicious purposes. So we're going to add that driver to the drivers. We're going to add a registry entry that allows this service to launch. And then we're going to add something else that tells Windows that this is supposed to be a driver. And that's an, uh, it's an enum root entry in the registry. And what you're going to see is that it's not going to be allowed to happen because Windows has protections it's put in place. Um, there we go. 
So if I press yes here, it's going to tell me I can't do it. Well, the problem with this is Windows doesn't do the best job of actually preventing you from accessing it. So all we really need to do is change the permissions on this key and we can do it. So I can say, okay, I'm going to become the owner of this key. And since I'm the owner of this key, I can tell you that everyone should be allowed to access this. So close that out. Now we put this in place. And all of a sudden, that's in. So the key components that are necessary to run this kernel driver are in place at the moment. Now I'm going to add one more registry key. And this is to ex kind of show off what it's capable of doing. And in this case, all it is is a registry key that tells my callback filter driver that I don't want to be able to launch this particular document. Read me for a demo. So once this driver is active, you're not going to be able to launch this anymore. I haven't loaded it yet, so you can see it. And then sort of as a control experiment, I have another one. And you can see that's working properly. So what I want to do now is enable the driver. And what we're going to do is we're going to use Windows own utility for loading the driver. And what you're going to see is that it's not going to be allowed. It's going to tell you access is denied. And that's because the application whitelisting product at this point is up and running. So if you try to load it after the fact, it's going to block it because it doesn't know about it. But we can exploit the ability that this driver is going to launch before it to actually exploit it. So we'll restart the computer at this point. And then we'll see what happens when we come back into the operating system. Now, sort of the main takeaways here are kernel level drivers are extremely powerful things. They're possible to start rootkit-like behavior. They can monitor any sort of access to the file system. They can monitor any sort of access to the registry. So for one of these to slip in undetected is a major issue if you're trying to provide security in your environment. And we're basically taking advantage of the same technology application whitelisting does in order to exploit it and see what we're capable of doing. So we'll reboot here. and. Like rootkits typically will, like if you try to open a file that's on the desktop or you know look into a folder, if it doesn't want you to see something, it's going to filter those results out so that when you navigate to that folder, it's going to be missing. And that's what this driver is going to allow us to do. It's going to allow us to change control of the operating system in some way so that we can perform malicious actions or hide what we're doing with other applications. So we'll log in here. And then we're going to try to start that driver again and see what happens. So we go back in. We try to load that driver. And we see that it says an instance of this service is already running because now the driver is active in memory despite the fact that this application whitelisting product is still working. So what can we do with it now? Well, we can deny access to a file. So there's this readme for compare, which we're supposed to be allowed to see. And then there's this one, which all of a sudden we can no longer view the contents of it because the access has been denied to it. So with this kernel level driver in place, I now have full control over what gets seen by the application whitelisting product and any user who's logged onto this computer, whether it's a registry entry, whether it's a file entry, regardless. So that's essentially one of the major exploits that can be used to bypass these solutions which rely on kernel level drivers. So I think the question at this point becomes, so now what? Uh, this, is, this is the building security side of the discussion. I'm not just breaking security. So what can we do? And what I want to stress is that the situation isn't hopeless, but you need to really make yourself aware of how these technologies work so you can better secure your environments. And I think the best first step for educating yourself is simply to go to a vendor and ask them what vulnerabilities exist in your product. I don't get this question enough as a security vendor myself. I want customers to ask me, what can I do to bypass your protection? Because that actually starts a meaningful dialogue. If you're not doing that, you're doing yourself a disservice. So what I'd suggest asking is, what inherent vulnerabilities exist in the, in the approach? And by that, I mean a good security product isn't designed to do everything. If it was, it's going to fail miserably at what it's trying to do, and it's going to not be very efficient about how it goes about it. Instead, it's focused on providing a specific tool or feature set. 
So like, let's look at signature-based antivirus. Signature-based antivirus is designed to detect things it knows about. Things it doesn't know about is not part of what it's designed to do. So that doesn't make it a bad product. It just means you can't rely on it to perform that aspect of security for you. So you need to ask what are the inherent vulnerabilities in those sorts of approaches. You know, application whitelisting. As I mentioned before, application whitelisting isn't designed to prevent exploited applications that are already whitelisted. So you need to know about that if you're going to build a successful security model. Now, another thing that's important to ask is what ease of use features I'm enabling are going to cause other problems. And by that I mean a lot of security tools will give you ways to either make it easier to manage them or make it easier to, uh, or to have less impact on the end user. And typically, these will open up lots of security holes uh, that are particularly problematic. In this case, I demoed how like the cert system, which is a way of making it easier to manage an application whitelisting solution, becomes a giant hole which you can drive a truck through. Um, which leads me to sort of a little rant. And that's because we're using technology for a purpose it wasn't intended to. Public key cryptography is a great technology, but it's designed to take a trusted point A and a trusted point B and send data across a channel you don't trust at all. That works until you start ignoring the fact that point A in this instance is an application vendor, such as you know Microsoft, and if they get compromised and their signing certificate is compromised, now malicious software can be signed. And this isn't just speculation. If you look at Stuxnet, they got J. Micron's uh, certificate, signed their malicious malware, and now all of a sudden, all those point Bs that allow JMicron are allowing this malicious piece of software to execute. So that's one end of the problem. The other end of the problem is you can't trust your point B, because if malicious code is able to execute as it was in the demo or in some way like that, now I can fool the way it views its certificates. I can either point it towards a different certificate store, or I can actually change the bits it reads with my kernel level driver or I could hijack the API commands to have them return different results. So ultimately, you need to ask yourself, if you need this security feature, or if you need this ease of use feature in order to manage and deploy your application, I would suggest not relying on certificates because you're creating a huge hole and now you're reliant on this to actually make the technology work in your environment. Um, um, another thing that you need to ask is how can malware directly attack your product? You know, ask how that product can be directly attacked because most malware written today, or at least a large majority of the sophisticated stuff, is designed to identify the security solutions that are present on the computer and either disable them or bypass them or trick them in some way. And I think what's important is when you first talk to a security vendor, you're probably not going to be talking to someone who has the expertise to tell you, you know, what these vulnerabilities are. So be insistent about being put in contact with someone who has that sort of knowledge. And ultimately, if a vendor won't put someone in front of you who is willing to honestly discuss these vulnerabilities, then they're withholding information that is vital to you securing your organization. And I'd say look for your security elsewhere. Uh, I think now the most important step once you realize that is don't stop there. So you've settled on a security vendor you think provides a meaningful solution. Well, that's going to be, that, that's all well and good, but people are inclined to just kind of deploy it and then forget about it. What I think people need to focus on doing instead is seeing are there ways I can cover for the vulnerabilities that exist in these products. So let's take for instance the uh, demo I had before. There's an inherent vulnerability with any product that relies on a kernel level driver to provide its sort of behavior if you can get underneath it. So the question is, can you detect the addition of that driver somehow, either by monitoring the registry or monitoring that driver's folder I put the driver into? Because if you can do that, now all of a sudden, this vulnerability in the product isn't something that's going to affect your organization or your endpoints. So first ask, do I have an existing tool that's going to allow me to execute these capabilities? If there is an existing tool that's going to allow you to do that, great. Implement it, you're good to go, and you're better off for it. 
if there isn't an existing one, then you have to really ask yourself, is this vulnerability important enough to my organization that I am willing to either buy another tool that allows for this or develop my own solution in order to, um, and to account for its failures? So our company started because we answered that question as no. The, the vulnerabilities were too large with the products we were seeing and we wanted a different approach to things. So ultimately we went, we designed a tool that gave the information we were looking for. We wanted to know what was automatically executing on every computer because if we knew that, we knew what persistent malware was trying to e exist on a computer. With that intelligence, we could respond more intelligently. Now, I don't expect many of you to go off and start your own security startup as a result of this sort of thing, but you can take some little steps that can be really helpful for improving your security. Um, to that end, uh, I think it's a lot easier if you look at a certain subset of the vulnerabilities, specifically how can malware attack these, uh, how can malware attack these products directly. Now the way malware developers go about it is they do what I do. They go out, they get that application whitelisting product, they install it on their computer, they start throwing little hijacks at it and see what sticks so that by the time it gets to your computer, they know it's going to work and it's going to bypass it. Well, if you take the time to put in your own little checks, well, malware developers can't just go out and get your solution off the shelf. It's something that's sort of proprietary to your organization. And the only way they can find out about it is to gather some sort of inside intelligence, which means targeting your organization specifically, which is a much more time-consuming, much more expensive endeavor for them and frankly, they don't know if they even need to do it to begin with. So if you can take steps to this extent, you're going to improve your security posture. Um, I think it begs the question, you know, what can I do to actually achieve this? And I think I'd start with just two simple examples, little scripts you can put in place. I think one important one is simply to script an attack on every single endpoint. So let's look at signature-based antivirus. We're going to run a script that basically moves a file that is known to be bad onto each endpoint in your organization, see if it gets detected, see if it gets quarantined, and see if it gets reported to your enterprise console. Now, gather that information through another channel and then compare it to what you're seeing from your enterprise console. Because if you don't see that attack show up, you know either the product's malfunctioning in some way, shape, or form, or malware has managed to subvert it to break the mechanism by which it's accurately reporting information. So putting a measure like this in place is going to give you more peace of mind that it's going, going to function properly. Another potential script or some kind of uh, monitoring you can put in place is simply to watch for a process to close. So you should see uh, malware will typically try to disable a process if it wants to shut it down. And if you see it end in a way that isn't consistent with, uh, you know, isn't consistent with a normal shutdown, you get valuable information from that. Either the product crashes and isn't reporting it to you properly, which is something you want to know regardless, or malware is specifically targeting it, and now you have insight you wouldn't have had if you didn't put those tools in place to begin with. So ultimately, I think the takeaway is that unless you really educate yourself on how these security technologies work at an underlying level, it's really difficult to have a security model that's going to be successful. But if you take sort of the additional steps of implementing your own little checks and balances on it, you're going to be able to come up with a far more successful security model, something that is less prone to attack and something that is ultimately going to be more rewarding for your organization and meet your needs. Um, There we go. So ultimately, that's the end of the conversation here, other than questions, because we want to give you time to sort of probe about it. So if anyone had any questions, um, yeah. You broke the whitelisting by taking a search score away. Why did you do it? OK, so uh, he, uh, this gentleman asked why Windows was able to boot at all when I took its search store away. And that's because the application whitelisting product realizes that there are certain signatures and certificates that it has to acknowledge regardless of uh, whether or not it exists in that folder location. So it, yeah, yeah, that's my understanding. It depends on the, it varies by product, but ultimately they'll tend to hard code that stuff in because it looks really bad for the organization if their product stops a Microsoft um, 
executable from running properly, which, as I'm sure you realize, also opens up some vulnerabilities if you can spoof the existence of a Microsoft certificate. The attacks you demonstrated, your admin system, or your user code? Uh, these particular attacks I was executing under the admin uh, with user, I disabled user account control in the uh, VM just to speed up the demonstration. But uh, yeah, the basis for that is the most damaging sort of attacks that you're really trying to stop tend to be the ones that are somehow able to get admin access and by bypass the protection offered by user account control. Were there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for listening. Feel free to come up to us afterwards, and we'll be happy to talk to you about any, uh, you know, any questions you might have on the techniques we're using or what we think is an important step in actually uh, securing your organizations more effectively. <laughs>